This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with the world's best writers about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today, we are talking to Joshua Milliken who was perhaps initially known within horror circles for the work that he did with Dread Central, starting in 2016, and then from 2019 through to 2021, he was the editor-in-chief. Now more recently, you may know Josh through the fiction that he has written. His debut novel, Deeper Than Hell, came out in 2022 via Encyclopocalypse Press. And most recently, he put out Teleportasm from Shortwave Publishing. It is the third book in the excellent Killer VHS series. You might also know Joshua because of his movie novelizations, including Forbidden Zone, the novelization of the iconic, the cult classic, Richard Elfman movie. And in this conversation, we talk about all of those books. We talk about early life lessons. We get some previously, as far as I understand, undiscussed, unrevealed Richard Elfman stories and a lot, lot more. So before any of that, a quick advert break. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching is the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Okay, here it is. It is Joshua Milliken on This Is Horror. Josh, welcome to This Is Horror. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a it's a real pleasure and an honor. Uh, you guys have all the really big names in indie horror and, and big names in horror. So, you know, I'm really humbled to have uh, made the roster. Oh, yeah, we are stoked to have you here. And we both recently finished reading Teleportasm, which is definitely going to form some of the discussion today. And I'm excited to talk about it. But before we do... I want to know about your early life lessons growing up and they don't have to pertain to writing. They don't have to pertain to cannabis culture as that is part of teleportasm, but they can, if you want. Uh, yeah, my, my life lessons. Well, you know, in terms of creativity, I guess I just always knew that I wanted to be a writer in some way, uh, from an early age, 
junior high, even when I started journaling and things like that. And, you know, in terms of, you know, my creative aspirations, you know, I've, I've tried, um, you know, music, I've been in horror journalism, you know, uh, horror fiction is kind of a new, um, chapter in my life. No pun intended. I uh, got into horror, uh, writing horror fiction, um, two or three years ago with the publication of my first novel. And I guess, uh, you know, my, my life lessons or my pearls of wisdom, uh, a lot of times you just got to go with the flow. Um, there's a lot of pressure these days to know exactly what you want to do and get to the pinnacle of, you know, whatever you uh, uh, define as success. But, you know, if you just stay true to your, your art and your inner voice and you believe in yourself, um, a lot of times things will work out organically. Does that have anything to do with what you were asking? It, it does, yeah. And right. I mean, in terms of writing stories, I mean, as you said, I guess in terms of people knowing you within the genre, they might know you before your fiction with Dread Central, but I want to know, you know, were you writing stories from an early age or were you more expressing yourself creatively through the bands? Where did the art start for you? Yeah, you know, thanks for asking because a lot of people have asked like, oh, was it, was it um, strange for you going from the world of journalism to, you know, the world of creative fiction? And it's actually not uh, I went to college at UC Santa Cruz, and it's one of the few state. It's one of the few colleges in America that offers creative writing as an undergraduate degree. So, um, you know, I, I studied creative writing in college. You know, doing workshops and more assignments, and you know, straining my brain in more ways than I could possibly imagine. So, I actually come from a creative background. You know, I was a creative writer before I was a journalist, and you know, I went from you know, writing stories and poetry to writing songs and lyrics for a while. And then when I got into journalism, I found that even though it was nonfiction and even though my, my um, concentration had been on the creative side of writing, I also had a degree in uh, literature. So I knew how to look at a piece of, of art, a book, a play, a film, you know, and understand character arc and symbolism and uh, foreshadowing and themes and things like that, that, you know, I found, uh, you know, when I, when I became really immersed in, in cinema, that I was able to take, you know, my same literature major brain and look at a film and films became books for me for many, many years. And in a lot of ways, they still are. So I went from being creative into journalism and it scratched that same itch because I was writing all the time, which I loved. And I was celebrating an aspect of, you know, art that I really appreciated. I was uh, passionate about horror, the horror genre. So being able to write about something I was passionate about, if you're writing about something you're passionate about, you're always going to be writing your best work. So it was great. You know, um, you know, there are definitely journalists who, I think are, are much, have much more of a, a profound profession, you know, people who are on the, the tip of the spear of, of history as it unfolds, you know, and, and horror, horror journalism maybe isn't as noble as that, but I, I still felt like it was what I was doing was noble and that I was elevating the films and uh, the, the work of, of people, the countless people who, who stand behind a, a director and the actors putting out these films, really celebrating their accomplishments and I just love doing that as a journalist. Now, here's the thing, though, to bring it around full circle. The years I spent in journalism, maybe like 10 years, really shaped my creative writing in that the lessons I learned in journalism were cut the fat. You know, not only do you lead with a hook, every sentence should be a hook because you don't want to give your reader the slightest opportunity to switch channels or to click to another website or something. You really got to keep people engaged. And I think because of my years in journalism, my writing now is really razor sharp. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying there. And I think for me, I mean, I started in journalism too before writing fiction. I was working for the extreme metal magazine Terrorizer, and then I was doing a lot oh, of... Nice. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> and then I was doing a lot for Scream magazine as well in the UK. And 
Well, of course, this is horror was born from that passion. But I mean, I, I think like the creativity, it never really leaves you. If that's what you want to do, then you're going to be doing it. And I mean, I, I'm wondering what were the films or the stories that first attracted you to the horror genre or that kind of made you stand up and like, oh, oh shit, th this is something we can do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the early, in the mid 2000s, uh, back when, you know, Netflix was the only streamer, their uh, library was immense. Basically, if something existed in digital form, it was on Netflix because it was like this great new frontier. And it, it was much more extensive than it is today where, you know, you have streaming content, you know, no matter when it was created, spread over five different entities now. So it rekindled my love of horror. And, you know, not only did I go back and revisit all the horror films that I had loved growing up, but now I had access to horror films that I never even knew existed, specifically foreign films. You're asking me what type. New French Extremity blew my mind. I'm talking about Martyrs. That film is just so haunting. And I know that uh, it gets brought up a lot and people are like, oh, the most brutal film ever made. And even the director, Pascal Lugy, he made some comment about how he's sorry he made the film, you know, and it's like, come on, that film is just as transcendent as it is brutal. You know, it's just as insightful as it is extreme. And, you know, a lot of the films from New French Extremity, um, uh, Frontiers by uh, Xavier Xavier Jean and um, High Tension by Alexander Aja. There were a lot of just great films that uh, I just really resonated with me. Because, you know, here's the thing for I, I love horror movie and I understand that, you know, mainstream horror, a lot of times there's a happy ending. But for me, sad endings are much more effective. Um, you know, not that I want to be sad. But, you know, that's the feeling that really sticks with me. And that's what sticks in my heart and sticks in my mind. And, you know, a lot of horror films, the way they end and they end in a, a happy way, it's really not realistic because for, for an experience to truly be a horror experience, it has to be transformative. You know, even if you survive your night with the slasher or the ghost, you know, you make it out of the warehouse, your life is never the same again. You know, so even if it's happy because you live, it's sad because of what you endured and because now you're changed forever. So I, I really loved bleak, uh, daring horror, just, you know, things that, uh, you know, just through all of the sort of um, mainstream and especially the American mainstream conventions to the wind. And it was like, you have no right to expect a happy ending. So, you know, just, you know, take it, take it or leave it. And I was just blown away. Yeah, and we can see how that philosophy in terms of characters being transformed and not necessarily having, <laughs> you know where I'm going, I can see from I know where you're going. your reaction, you know, with, with what you've done with teleportasm, that is, yeah, very literal and figurative in terms of the transformation. But I love because you've got so many different characters it's like there are numerous endings it, it's not as linear as saying well this is the the end of the story and it's like well which story within the story what are you talking about here right right if i sold the movie rights you could you know make a film about the the four main characters or you could make a whole film just about chapter nine you know <sighs> well yeah it's, you know there are stories within there and it's interesting too because you know for the sake of of, you know, brevity and continuity and, and, you know, overall quality, there are actually like three or four full chapters, edited chapters that uh, we just put aside. So there are other teleportasm stories out there that maybe someday we'll release as a chat book or uh, release chapters in a magazine or something. But yeah, it, it was great the way I was able to not just tell a story, you know, give an emotional three act story to, to these four main characters. But, you know, also I, I was able to just throw so much against the wall, uh, that I, I was able to, you know, really play in a, a, an entire universe as opposed to just a world. Mm -hmm. It had that, uh, like I said in my tweet yesterday that it had this world war Z kind of, of, of aesthetic to it 
because you you had you had all these stories about the same thing, and and I love that kind of stuff because you get you get these complete tales that that just they add to the whole, and it was as soon as I realized that I was I was like oh man this is this is my jam right here you know uh, because well, I like those it's not really like, like an What's that? I'm sorry. I was. I'm sorry. I was just saying. So glad you liked it, man. Really, I appreciate oh, that. Yeah, no problem. No problem, man. It was a great book, but the uh, that uh, it's not really epistolary. I can't never say that word, but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's more like episodic a anthology. Yeah, it's like a pseudo anthology uh, because you know there are chapters that seem to stand alone, but they really don't because they're informed by the chapters before them. And things that seem random are later revealed to all have been, you know, connected, uh, you know, part of the, the completed puzzle. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it was a, it was a really interesting way to write for sure. Oh yeah. It had a very, uh, mosaic, mo- what they call mosaic novel effect. And I thought that was just really, really cool. You did it. You knocked it out of the park with that. Oh, thank you. I think it's similar to how the Martian Chronicles was uh written mm-hmm. you know each chapter is kind yes. of a standalone and you kind of uh, see the big picture when you kind of know all of the perspectives by the end you know um so yeah it, it's a pseudo anthology um you know and yeah i guess that's how i describe it it's a novella a pseudo anthology you can edit this out because now i'm kind of rambling we should do a drinking <laughs> game of how many times i say what were we just talking about or something <laughs> along those lines <laughs> No, I, I think what you're saying is all relevant. And I mean, we weren't planning on jumping into tele- teleportasm so, you know, early into the conversation. But now that we've hinted at it, we, we got to do it. So let's, do it. <laughs> let, let's just begin with, I mean, the origin story. Where did this idea come from? Yeah, um, you know, it's crazy because teleportasm is about 30,000 words, but I, I kid you not, I probably wrote 100,000 words to get to these 30,000 words. And the original idea was much darker, um, but it still had to do with a friendship. There was like a friend trying to rescue a friend from a technology cult. You know, the way I first pitched it, it was like Hellraiser by way of the Philadelphia experiment where this VHS tape was going to be kind of like the lament configuration and open portals. And it didn't really fit with the vibe of the whole Killer VHS series, which, you know, is uh, something that, you know, I'm coming into at part three, you know, so there's an, an expectation in terms of the franchise. So, you know, after I had kind of this first draft, I worked closely with uh, Alan Lestufka, who's the um, founder of Shortwave Publishing. And, you know, we kind of... Uh, uh, went back to the drawing board and, you know, looked at the elements that worked really well and, you know, threw a lot of things against the wall. And, you know, one of the things about the first draft of teleportasm, it was really glum. It was really, you know, not to say that there was no humor in it, but, you know, overall it was, uh, it was, it was, it was an impressively dark experience by design. And I guess I started thinking about some of the, the, the lightest elements of the first draft and what I could pull over. And there were, there were these elements of, you know, friends from college kind of drifting apart, you know, after kind of like the bubble of college ends, you know, the, the extension of adolescence that college affords, you know, ends and now you go into the real world and you're kind of lost, you know. So I just kind of took those elements friendships, you know, times are changing. And then I took the the technology element of this VHS tape that induces teleportation and thought about ways that I could make it into a story that fit a lot more with the vibe of the killer VHS series as a whole. Yeah. And I think the pacing and the various tonal shifts throughout are absolutely masterful because I mean, you you definitely caught me off guard a number of times. I mean, when I started the story, the first few chapters, I mean, instantly I was having a great time, but it was like quite lighthearted, almost like a stoner comedy. There was a lot of references to cannabis culture. I thought, yeah, this is a light read. This is dialogue heavy. I love it. But then you just ratcheted up the violence and the 
things that were happening as a result of viewing this tape. And actually, I listened to a conversation with you and Rob Olson on the Ark Party. Great guy. And you were talking about, yeah, yeah, we, we love Rob at This Is Horror. He's been on the show and we've collaborated with him a, a awesome. number of times. But you kept referencing chapter nine and you, you were doing it before I had read all of the book. And then when I came to chapter eight, I thought, did you two say the wrong chapter? Because chapter eight is very, very violent in a way that the chapters that followed before that they hinted at it, but you, you took it up to 11. And then I got to chapter nine. <laughs> it's like, Oh, oh yeah, you, you got the chapter right. I mean, it's, it, yeah, because yeah, it is a tonal shift. It's bleak. It reminded me of Stephen King's The Stand in some ways. You know, that, that chapter it's alone. Referenced. Uh, Stephen King's The Stand is actually referenced in one of the notes that Snaps leaves along yeah. the way. But uh, yeah, you're right. You know, um, in, in terms of, you know, chapter eight going all the way up to 11, you know, what I was trying to do for the most part was kind of like up the ante with each chapter, right? So we start with what's kind of like already in the mythology of teleportation, which is getting stuck in walls. You know, so, okay, you know, you're stuck in a wall, you know, where do you go from there? And I was trying to like, you know, each time make it a little more horrific or a little more outlandish. So yeah, by the time I get to chapter eight, it's kind of like, I, I really got to go nuts to really like, you know, give a payoff that it is worth, you know, the fact that I've set this, scenario a similar scenario three or four times by now you know so but with chapter nine uh it's the tonal shift you know chapter eight you know might very well be um sort of like the uh the graphic climax although you know chapter 12 is is pretty gory as is chapter all of them but yeah. anyway <laughs> but with chapter nine yeah i definitely wanted to do a tonal shift kind of have this you know rug pulled out from you, your stomach drops, you know, you're in an airplane that, you know, suddenly drops or something like that. And even though it, it does go back to sort of the light dialogue, I feel like the tone is bleaker from there on out that, you know, it's kind of like, okay, you had your fun, you know, laugh now, cry later, cry now. Yeah. And I think with chapter nine as well, it, it does serve as almost a twilight zone episode but much like the twilight zone it really gets you thinking what would you do in this scenario mm -hmm. in this new world if we can say that we, you know I'm, I'm trying not to spoil it but <laughs> you know yeah yeah so yeah i i was thinking about well, what what would i do in that situation i I hope that I wouldn't go the way of many people within the world, but but what else is there left to do? <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it yeah. really you, does make you, you think. That? Could you endure that level of isolation? You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we all, you know, as writers can think that we're quite good at solitude, at isolation, but that's a test. <laughs> it's a big test. For real. For real. Did it take something out of you to be able to write that, to get into that emotional space? Because, I mean, it, it also, it feels heavier to read. And I got to think as the writer, you know, you might have had to bleed a little. Yeah, you know, and, you know, like I said, yeah, I don't mind doing teasers. I, I feel worse about what happened to Frankie than I do about what happened to Ophelia, just because I feel like even with the name, I kind of hinted that this was going to be a tragic character but i do feel bad when people have said things like it was the most depressing thing i ever read because it's not really my goal to you know i'm not trying with teleportasm to bring you down to the lowest low and there was another comment that said it was mean-spirited and it was a great review but i don't know if it was mean-spirited i mean i wasn't trying to rub your nose in anything um it's just how it unfolded in my mind and i saw the ending in my mind I saw, you know, the processional and I was just like, oh my God, you know, cause you know, I came up with, I guess you could say twist number one. And then just to make it even worse, I was like, wow. And then 
after this, you, you look farther down the road and what do you see? And it's even, it's even worse than what you thought before. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we're hyping it enough where everyone's going to buy it and just like read it like hell, just get up to chapter nine to know what we're talking about. I I think it's totally worth doing that. And actually, because I had heard you and Rob talk about chapter nine, it almost made it more exciting for me to get to it. Like what yeah. is going to happen at this point? But I'm pleased. I, I guess I can understand why a reader might have found it the most depressing thing they'd ever read. But I, I, I don't think it has to be totally depressing. We see what a subset of people have done in that universe when they've discovered it. But we haven't seen what another quantity of people who were more optimistic. So I don't think everyone that goes to that area, <laughs> let's <laughs> say, is going to meet that fate. Yeah, that, that's another thing that's great about it. And, you know, uh, any work of art is, you know, I'm proud that I created something that kind of lives on in the reader's imagination and allows you to take it to whatever other steps uh, you want to think about. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and in that world, I mean, I think I would be pretty entertained for a number of years because you can, you can test drive any vehicle. There's <laughs> yeah. a lot of cars and bikes that I want to, <laughs> I want to have a go on. So, <laughs> you know, there is that at least Absolutely. a lot of canned food. Plenty. <laughs> What, what I liked about it was it was you you had you had this ramp up and then you get to this this like apocalyptic vision and and being it the story's told non you know non linearly non oh man, I can't even talk tonight it might be the flat tire uh, <laughs> but uh, from just over zoom <laughs> but uh it, it and it also shifts in time. But I think that that actually sets you up for the dystopia part of it that comes after that with the cult and everything. Uh, it had a very uh, J.G. Ballard uh, effect to, you know, if, if to me, if someone was filming this movie, uh, it would probably be probably to me, the best director would be Brandon Cronenberg because he can bring in this, this, that kind of aesthetic and still do with the goopy, you know, body effects, just like his dad could. And I, you know, and I'm thinking David could do a good job, but I think Brandon kind of gets the, the, the cult aspect of things a lot better. Yeah. I think and Brandon and I are more of the same generation, but you know, the father, son Cronenbergs are, were definitely influences <laughs> on teleportasm. You know, each, each entry in the killer VHS series uh, kind of has its own sub genre. The first one Melonhead Mayhem is like a creature feature, uh, you know, specifically of the humunculi variety, you know, gremlins or ghoulies or critters. And then you mm -hmm. have the second one, which was Candy Cane Kills, which is a Christmas slasher, you know, a very popular subgenre of horror. With teleportasm, you get analog body horror. And, you know, as soon as I say analog body horror, you're thinking of David Cronenberg. Right. But it also, it, I saw also this kind of, uh, I guess this, um, you know, with the way that they became kind of like mindless zombies, I seen this Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter aspect to it too. And I was like, this is, this is fucking so cool, man. <laughs> and nice. I, I think that you have to pull, you have to have, you have to go through that apocalyptic section to, to, to be to, to be kind of uplifted a little bit, but then go, Oh wait, this is even fucking worse. You know, it's like how, how we got here is even fucking worse than that. That's, that's the way I felt. Cause I would, I would not want to be alive during the latter part of the actual story right. where you, you're, you're having to, to, to run for your life against a, a mob of uh, mutants creatures. basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Creatures. Creatures. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, I mean, tonally, it almost reminded me of Keith Rosson's Fever House in the sense that it's like you're just switching up genres and introducing new elements at any given moment. Like there's no predictability, but like in a really good and a really fun way. And just because there was no predictability, it all 
was logical. It all was consistent. It was just so intricately woven. And of course, another way, another choice that you made was to not tell it necessarily in chronological order. So was that always the way that you envisaged telling the story? Or did you kind of have to weave it together and kind of change uh, chapters about in terms of the ordering? Well, yeah, I like that I, you know, was popping ahead in the future. But if you, if you notice by the third act, it does start to line up chronologically. So yeah, it does jump into the future a few times. But by the time you get to, I think, Welcome to Dead World, everything after that is chronological. Uh, because the, you know, kind of like the story of the, you know, the night uh, has already been told. So it does kind of catch up. And uh, I like that idea. I, I did like being able to play with it a little, uh, although I did worry about, you know, being a little too complex. In, in terms of, you know, the tone shifts, the one chapter that, you know, the publisher, Alan, and, and you know, I was also a little concerned about as well, you already mentioned was, was the cult chapter. Um, because, you know, again, you get a shift there and it's almost a, um, a genre shift. Uh, that's the sci-fi chapter. You know, a lot of times you, you'll read some reviews and they'll compare teleportasm to the X-Files. Well, they're talking about this specific chapter, you know, because, you know, basically when Alan and I were talking about that, you know, sub story, we were calling it the X-Files chapter, you know, um, it is kind of a, a another change. And this is in the third act. So, you know, Alan and I were both kind of like, okay, we've taken people on quite a ride up until this point. How are they going to feel about going from, you know, a, a zombie apocalypse to, uh, you know, CIA, you know, undercover, you know, sort of thing. And, you know, I was like, all I can hope is that even if you're, you get to that point and you're kind of like, oh man, why did Josh go here after he was going here and here and here? I hope that what you learn in this X-Files chapter, this, you know, kind of a heavier sci-fi chapter, I hope that that adds to the feelings at the end. I hope that the payoff might not be in the more, if you have a problem with that chapter, you know, that, that you will find a payoff in it with the knowledge you've, you've gained when you see, you know, how all the dominoes do ultimately fall. Yeah, I felt that at that point that any chapter could be kind of anything goes. I, I was already at that point, I'm already on the ride. and <laughs> It's just going to take me where it takes me. But yeah, there were a lot of times where I was thinking, how the hell are you going to wrap all this up and make it consistent? But then you did. And I see what you mean about, you know, enjoying sad endings. It's not <laughs> it's not exactly a feel good end to it, but I I think you know that it's not exactly going to be a happy ending. I mean it it's not happy fifty percent in, so <laughs> you know how could it be? There you go. There you go. It's not like I pulled the rug out of an, out from under you in that regard at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's bleak. Yeah, it's bleak from the beginning. But I mean one of the more comedic chapters i think was chapter four which is boys in the wood and so immediately i'm obviously thinking of boys in the hood and then when i found out about a certain something it's like oh hood oh okay i see what you did there you see what i did there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean what was there ever a kind of concern in terms of trying to get the balance between, I suppose, comedy and horror within the piece as a whole? Absolutely. You know, because, you know, especially in the writing stage, you know, you're, when you're just, you know, throwing everything against the wall, <laughs> it, it, there were, there were much more extreme or not, maybe not much more extreme, but there, there were definitely things that Alan was kind of like, remember, we're trying to, you know, appeal to a, a wider audience, hint, hint, you know, and there were things in that chapter that were a lot more extreme, both in terms of the conversation that these kids are having. You know, I, I don't think it's a, a spoiler to tell people that we're, we're talking about a chapter uh, that takes place with these uh, uh, kids in junior high, and uh, they're talking about female anatomy and their lack of understanding of it. And it's, it's cute because it's kind of innocent, but it's also kind of like super bad. And, uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely did 
<laughs> just take it to ridiculous extremes. Not just in chapter four, but there were other chapters where Alan was kind of like, uh, okay, we see that you can gross us out. Yeah, yeah. You're hardcore. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Let's dial it back a couple notches. But, you know, uh, you know, ultimately, I'm glad. I'm glad I had someone there reminding me to strike a balance because I don't think uh, I made anything less horrific by making it, um, you know, uh, easier to read. And you said that Alan was reminding you that you were appealing to a wider audience. I mean, who is the the audience, I suppose, that the VHS series and, and, and specifically teleportasm is going to to you know hopefully target because i mean in in a very good way from reading it i felt like you guys don't give a shit you're just telling a great story you're like whatever you know take it or leave it so it, it's interesting to hear these conversations were happening no yeah i mean that's totally valid you know, I think again, the metaphor I made about, you know, like a film director coming into part three or part four, you know, it's not your job to throw everything into left field. You know, you're there to uh, maintain a, a vibe that's, you know, been established, you know, honor that and give fans of the series, uh, you know, what they're expecting in terms of who are these fans. You know, it's, it's the series has now famously been described as, you know, like goose, a modern day goosebumps for adults. And there's your audience right there. You know, you, you want maybe the exact same people who read goosebumps as their gateway into horror who now want to be like, all right, you know, let me read something that's going to put me in that same mood. That said, teleportasm is definitely the most R rated so far of the three killer VHS novels, you know, it's definitely, uh, in terms of language, in terms of gore, you know, I think it's one of the few, uh, body horror works that shortwave has ever published actually. Yeah. So that's almost a challenge to the people who will follow. It's like, right, this is the most extreme. So what well, you got? Speaking of what's to follow a great segue for me to just say real quick that some excellent things are following and soon. Uh, in the fall, uh, the next killer VHS book is Cicada by Tanya Pell, which has already gotten fantastic early reviews. And then in December, we're getting Candy King Kills again, which is the first sequel of the killer VHS series. Uh, Brian McCauley is coming back to pick up right where Candy King Kills left off. And it's going to be fantastic. Not only that, the next two entries in the killer VHS series have already been announced. One of them's a witchcraft boarding school type horror. And the other one is a Bigfoot horror movie, which I, or excuse me, not horror movie book, Bigfoot horror, but I can't wait for that. So uh, killer VHS is awesome. Going to all these different sub genres, really talented writers across the board. Not again, I'm just really happy to be on the roster. Yeah. Who would, uh, two offers for the Bigfoot one and the, was it like witches at boarding school? Was that how you pitched it? Thanks for putting me on the spot, man. Really, really appreciate. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you, you'll have to, you'll have to, you'll have to look it up and add it into the notes. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that uh, um, Melonhead Mayhem was written by Alex Evanstein, uh, Candy Cane Kills and Candy Cane Kills again, or uh, Brian McCauley. Both incredibly talented authors. Uh, Alex has this uh, real knack for writing uh, creature horror. He does some great dinosaur horror. And uh, Brian's first novel, um, Curse of the Reaper, is a, a wonderful Hollywood meta horror that Scream fans are totally going to love. So uh, I, I know my killer VHS authors, just not the final two. <laughs> yeah. The final. Yeah. And in, in terms of Brian, I mean, my understanding is that your friendship precedes actually getting involved and indeed is the reason that you wanted to be involved in this. So how did you and Brian first connect? Brian and I were both members of the Los Angeles chapter of the Horror Writers Association. And when we both went to our first meetings a few years ago, we were both there as first time novelists. He had just come out with Curse of the Reaper, 
And uh, my book, Deeper Than Hell, had just been released through Encyclopocalypse. And so we're, we instantly like hit it off and we're goofing around like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we both got nominated for Stoker Awards and Best Debut Novel? You know, and, and we're the cool kids in, in the L.A. horror scene, you know, and, and we just instantly clicked. He even joined my horror trivia team for a while. Um, he, he's now teaching at, at a university in Arizona, and I miss him dearly. But back to the story, uh, you know, when we were talking and hanging out, I'm like, what are you working on next? And he's like, Killer VHS, Candy Cane Kills. And I had heard of Killer VHS, you know, because I, I follow the, the indie publishing scene on Twitter. I think that's the best place to see who's doing what and what's happening. And I was like, you know what? I would love to get on that series. And he's like, yeah, pitch to Alan. So I came up with the concept for teleportasm specifically for killer VHS. And uh, it wouldn't have existed if I hadn't met Brian and then been extra inspired to try to hop on this bandwagon while it was still in the early formative stages. And I'm so glad I did. Because, uh, like I said, you know, now the the next four are already set, and uh, you know, it, it's it's just a wonderful project to be a part of. I'm so glad that I was able to get in on this series. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what was the hardest thing about writing Teleportasm? I mean, the hardest thing was also one of the most enjoyable things. You know, normally, you know, a writer writes in solitude. It's, it's a very solitary process. But because this is part of a series, uh, Alan and I decided that we would work, you know, uh, have a closer relationship than most uh, writers and their publishers would have. And, you know, after I turned in my first manuscript and, you know, got the feedback that, you know, tonally it, it wasn't really a match for what had preceded it. You know, maybe I was I was disappointed for about thirty seconds, but then I was I was really inspired by the challenge of revisiting this first draft manuscript and really making Alan happy because I believed in Alan's vision. So in that sense, uh, I was writing for an audience of one because Alan was the architect. Alan had set the tone. Alan had the vision for what was to precede it, uh, and. I believed in him. So there was a lot of, you know, this is working, this isn't working. I was sharing things with him much earlier than I had with my previous publishers. Like normally I wouldn't share something in a, a rough stage, but I, I really wanted to ask Alan his opinion on things before I proceeded in one direction or another. Even if I had a question of dialogue, you know, I'd hit him up. So that was the most challenging aspect of it, but it was always, but it was already, but it was also the most satisfying aspect of it. And it's, you know, what I miss, you know, uh, now, you know, and I hope that I'll find my next project as satisfying as I did this one, even though I might not just because, you know, it's, a, it's not the normal relationship I think that an author has with this publisher. Um, you know, I miss kind of checking in with him on the reg and, you know, working through this and, and really feeling like he and I were becoming of like mind on just about everything. So, uh, it was, it was challenging, but being challenged was so rewarding. So given how positive the experience was with Alan, are you looking to work together again? Are you kind of eagerly scouring what projects they have on so you can pitch him? Or have there been any talks for future collaborations? If he doesn't already, I assume he knows this already. He, he can just you know, send me an email at any moment and I'll get to work. You know, we've tossed around ideas. Alan is, however, very focused on uh, shortwave as a whole. And I know that uh, for the time being, uh, the Killer VHS series is pretty, pretty well locked down. And I also know that he's looking to highlight female writers kind of in the next stage of shortwave. He might be putting out fewer books, but concentrate on marketing those in, in, in better ways to position them. And, you know, he's just doing so many things with, with shortwave. You know, if, if this was a once in a lifetime experience, I'll always, I'll always treasure it. He, he could just, but he could just, you know, get into my inbox and I'd be working for him again on the fly. All right. And of course, before Teleportasm, as you said before, your debut novel was Deeper Than Hell. Now this came out about 10 years after you started 
your blog and all the stuff that you were doing with Dread Central, I guess, about five years after that. So I'm wondering how the debut novel came about and kind of what stories had you written prior to it? That's a great question. You know, I actually wrote Deeper Than Hell uh, while I was a, a horror blogger and up and coming horror journalist. And when I got the job as, well, when I first got promoted to managing editor and then editor in chief of Dread Central, I kind of put my own creative endeavors on the shelf. So, you know, uh, Deeper Than Hell sat on a shelf for a few years, actually, while I focused 100% on Dread Central because that was a legacy horror site. That was a, a, a storied institution that I was proud to be a part of. I was uh, in a position of great control and potential influence, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't mess it up. So Dread Central had 100% of my attention 100% of the time. And I stepped away from uh, Dread Central when my son was born. And, you know, then the, the thought of going back to Dread Central in the same capacity um, was no longer tenable. You know, when you're a parent, you can't give 100% to... A career no matter how much you love it you know no matter because uh, working for dread central never felt like work you know even if i was working you know 60 hour weeks when you love what you do you never work a day in your life so you know it was awesome but i wasn't going to have that time commitment anymore or the desire to be glued to my computer following horror news as it unfolded you know, keeping up with the trades, things like that. So it was going to be time for me to transition. So that's when I took Deeper Than Hell off the shelf, dusted it off. And, and the good thing was that, you know, during the, the years that it had been on a shelf, I had gotten a, a, been able to build my own name and reputation, my own brand, if you will, of, of horror, cannabis-infused horror, uh, if you will, uh, to the point where I, I think I had enough of a name where, a publisher was interested in releasing my debut novel and what a perfect connection it was to meet the guys in Encyclopocalypse because they have one foot in literature and one foot in film. About 50% of their operation is novelizations. And, uh, you know, in terms of their you know, original creative output, they publish a lot of filmmakers like Tom Holland, like Peter Atkins, like John Penny. So, you know, on both sides of their operation, you, you have a strong connection to horror cinema. So, you know, having been Josh from Dread Central for so many years, it was just amazing to find myself at Encyclopocalypse. And they were uh, awesome and, and wonderfully supportive of Deeper Than Hell. And, you know, it, I think it was a success. It, it has over 100 uh, ratings on Goodreads which I think is fantastic for a debut novel. And I think that, um, you know, more people will be reading it now that teleportasm, uh, seems to be bringing more attention to, to my other works. And, uh, I'm really, I'm really proud of it. And, uh, I'm glad that I made this shift to, um, writing fiction, writing books. I think, you know, in my heart, it's something I dreamed of as a kid, you know, uh, having my books and signing books, and things like that. So it's, it's a real dream come true. And I hope that I can do it for the rest of my life. Yeah, I hope you can too. I mean, both for you and selfishly, because I enjoyed the hell out of reading your story. So I want there to be much more of it. But, yeah. you know, I think what you're saying about now that teleportasm has come out that deeper than hell will get more attention, it's 100% right. And, you know, sometimes I see writers getting upset about you know, the, the attention or lack of attention that an individual book got. But it's like, but it, this is just a part of the puzzle. It's like it only takes one to really blow up and then your entire back catalog is getting attention. I mean, I think a lot of that must have happened to Paul Tremblay with A Head Full of Ghosts because, you know, some people... They think A Head Full of Ghosts is his first book. It's like, no, he wrote a lot of crime novels before then. And yeah, I mean, even Keith Rosson, who we mentioned earlier, like Fever House has brought him attention like no other book that he's written. But 
goodness, how many had he written before that? Like five, there's like six, four. seven? Yeah. I think four. there's four or five, <laughs> yeah. and then there's yeah. a st- short story collection too. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's he's been in this game for a long, long time. So, Well, books yeah, are the- different than films as well. You know, it's like if you miss your opening weekend, uh, you know, if your opening weekend doesn't hit like you hope, that's it, you know, and, and the whole history of the film is written down to its, you know, eventual release and distribution and everything like that. And that's kind of it. It's left for history to decide from that point onward. It's not the same with books. They can hit, you know, a few months later, they can hit a few years later. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in terms of the marketing and the promotion, both, in terms of getting your name out there as a writer and indeed promoting individual books, what kind of things are you doing? Well, I mean, the, the killer VHS series pretty much promotes itself, you know, cause you know, you can buy it from Amazon and it'll come in an envelope, right? But you order it directly from uh, shortwave and it comes in this box that looks like an old school VHS tape with the synopsis on the back and everything, you know, and, and the book looks great. The cover art by Mark Volchik is, is just amazing. And then you've got this box left over that you can hide your weed in and your cartridges. And then, you know, you just put it on a shelf and, uh, order the next killer VHS book. There you go. Well, well you, you yeah. just immediately, sold a lot more it's like you hide your drugs in it <laughs> there you go. I, I joke but you know it, alan really is a, a great uh, at what he does he's an, an amazing designer um his his marketing skills are, are top notch so yeah um you know we got it to as many um book talkers and grammars and tubers as we could and um you know, hopefully, hopefully the buzz is, is still building. Um, but, but another great aspect of the killer VHS series is, you know, each new release brings attention to every installment that came before it. And this right, is really yeah. a great year for killer VHS, you know, teleportasm just hit and you've got two more to look forward to before 2025. So get on it. Yeah, yeah, I think this conversation might have helped us source our horror Christmas episode as well. You know, I didn't know that there was going to be a sequel to Brian's book, so there you go. There yeah, you it's go. Already, there already, go. In, uh, already on the charts. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. But in terms of cannabis culture, I mean, what do you think are some of the misconceptions? And I mean if you could indulge us a little bit in terms of like different strains for different moods, whether it's like creativity, whether it's relaxing, you know, talk us through it. I'm really glad you asked because, you know, um, the, the cannabis consumer stereotype has basically been set in stone since Cheech and Chong came on the scene. And I love Cheech and Chong and they are funny as hell. And they really portray a certain aspect of cannabis smoking to a T. I love those guys, but they really did um, cannabis a disservice in that respect because before Cheech and Chong, you know, the the stereotypical cannabis smoker was a a, a rebel rouser, a college student, you know, you know, leading a, a protest march, you know, against the war. A cannabis smoker was a beatnik poet. A, a cannabis smoker was a jazz guitarist cannabis smoker was a painter, you know, all these great things. So as much as I love Cheech and Chong, you know, I I think, uh, you know, they kind of really limited, they gave tunnel vision to the whole idea of what a cannabis consumer is. And I'm really glad that with um, the fact that at least here in America, sorry, uh, California, sorry, Bob out in Texas, at least here in California and other states, you know, where, you know, they're realizing a, it has so many medicinal benefits. You, you, you might not know it unless you can see what I look like, but I, I've been a cannabis smoker for quite some time. And in, in California, specifically, California was the epicenter of the medical marijuana movement, specifically in Northern California around San Francisco, where, you know, there were hard fought battles convincing politicians to allow people with cancer and AIDS to smoke cannabis, to feel better, to help their appetite, you know, and that was really the crack in the wall. 
because from there, it, you know, so many people were just talking about the benefits of cannabis. You know, not everyone is this Cheech and or Chong who just wants to smoke and do nothing and who's just kind of a drain on society. Or to be fair, a, a jazz playing rabble rouser either. You know, ordinary people are enjoying cannabis, which goes back to what you were saying about which strain for what. Cannabis is humongous. Cannabis is almost as big as horror. Let me take the metaphor a, a step further. It's like saying, I don't like horror movies because I saw Friday the 13th once and I didn't like it. Well, just because you don't like Friday the 13th doesn't mean that you don't like horror movies. You know, you, maybe you just need to see Pan's Labyrinth, you know, or, or, or you know, uh, Idle Hands. You, you just haven't seen the right horror movie because everyone likes horror these days. Come on. Same thing with cannabis. Oh, I smoked cannabis once and, and I had a, a panic attack. You smoked the wrong strain. You smoked a heavy strain of indica when you should have smoked a light strain of sativa. It's basically, you know, one or the other in terms of what do you smoke. Indica is where you're going to get a body high. You're going to feel it, uh, you know, in your internal organs. You're going to feel it in your fingertips and your toes, maybe even in your teeth. And it scares some people. Uh, sativa, you might not even know you smoked anything. You're just going to all of a sudden be uh, having this great conversation or having these great ideas or getting, you know, uh, calling someone you haven't talked to in a long time. So cannabis is humongous. And I'm sorry uh, in Texas that, you know, they're just less um, um, progressive at this time. And, you know, I don't know what it's like for you, Michael, out in Japan. I imagine it's also quite taboo down there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I unfortunately so, yeah. I, I'm it, so entrenched in cannabis culture that I forget it's not legal other places. I went to South by Southwest a few years ago before the pandemic, and I have friends in Austin, so they hooked me up. And then, you know, I'm walking around, and it's like this total festival atmosphere, you know, with all the bands playing and the events happening. So I reach in my backpack, I pull out my weed, I start smoking. My friends are like, what are you doing, Josh? You can't do that. It's like, oh yeah, I'm not in California anymore. You know, I'm in I'm in Texas. There are different rules here. So there you go. I think it's I think it's lightening up a little bit. I mean, it, it's still going to be probably be years, but we're we're getting at instead of thinking like 20 years ago where I was said decades. Now we're getting into years, mm -hmm. and it's um, you know, it, it's we're just stuck in a conservative rut right now and it sucks. And, uh, there's a lot more I could say on that, but I'm going to be a nice guy tonight. And there not, you go. Not, uh, I'll, not say talk all you. I'll say it for yeah. you. They can all send their hate mail to me. They, they can call <laughs> me a donor. I can deal with it. Ironically though, you know, one of Tommy Chong's, uh, I don't know if it's his most recent role, but he had a great part in color out of space, uh, not too long ago where he played yes. kind of like this mystic, and I thought it was a really great way to kind of bring the stoner stereotype to another level. Because I think you're finding now a lot of these old hippie dudes who have been smoking weed for, you know, 50 years, they really do kind of have some sort of connection to the natural order of things to balance, you know, and, and then, you know, you can bring uh, cannabis and cannabis culture. You can mind people of the, the shamanistic roots of not only uh, cannabis inhalation, but other plants and, things like that. And it all becomes very fascinating. And I, I think it is a, a source of, uh, if, if not wisdom, at least genuine knowledge. Yeah. And you're absolutely right that, you know, initially cannabis culture, cannabis smoking was very much associated with the jazz musicians, with the beat poets, with people like Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs. And then, yeah, th there was somewhat of a dip <laughs> with the stoner stereotype. But I do feel that it is now kind of coming full circle. And, and not just with cannabis, but I think perhaps some time ago, there was ignorance that it's like, oh, all, all drugs are the same. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, they ain't. <laughs> that is why there are different classifications you know, if you smoke a joint or you inject up uh, some strong heroin, you're going to have a bit of a different <laughs> effect there. And so 
I don't know if you know, um, you know, uh, having not been, you know, born and raised in America, but it actually was in the same category as crack cocaine and heroin until very recently. The FDA, you know, which sets these standards in America, absolutely was telling everyone until very, very recently, I think maybe even 2024, it remained in the exact same category as heroin and crack cocaine. Uh, okay. Yes, so that just that changed. I, I am hearing this for the first time, and I can't believe that nobody's told me that. Because in, in the UK, you, you know, even from my childhood, it, like heroin was class A, marijuana was class C. I did not I just, know that yeah. in America they were both class A. What? It's ridiculous, and I think that's why you know there's such an uh, uh, an era, an aura of distrust between a lot of cannabis users and the government because you know you can't tell a cannabis user that that they're doing something to their body that's as bad as shooting smack. You just can't do that, and you can't say that you know you can't tell a cannabis user that they're addicted, that they're just as bad as somebody who's given their life to crack cocaine. It's like telling me that the sky is, is purple, you know, when it's clearly blue and it's just nuts. But yeah, can you believe it that until just recently, even though, even though that it's been legalized in some states and even though you've got, you know, Sanjay Gupta on CNN talking about the benefits of cannabis and how he's changed his uh, official stance it still was technically on the federal level mm -hmm. the same kind of drug as heroin until very, very recently. Yeah. And the, <laughs> it reminds me of something that was said probably, and I can't remember if it was either George Carlin or Bill Hicks who said it, and I believe it was Bill Hicks, is that the two most dangerous drugs in the world are tobacco and alcohol. Hands and, down. And, and if you can buy them, and the reason that you can buy them is because they can fucking tax it. He goes, as soon as they figure out a way to tax marijuana, it will be legal. They have, and, Bob. And that's why. Yeah, you know, it's, that, that, uh, it's, it's a state's rights thing. That's what it right. comes up to. It's, it's based when on the states. Saw, when everyone saw that Calif Colorado raised billions with a B for their <laughs> roads, for their schools, for their infrastructure off a of cannabis tax billions that simply would not have existed that, exactly. that would have just been part of a, a black a black market that would have been happening anyway of course other states are jumping on it now and it's funny it's like states unfortunately like texas they're really just being obstinate about it at this point you know oh we still have ignorant fucks who's like well people have od'd on marijuana and i've seen it on tv <laughs> they, they od'd and died on the marijuana but the boy sure. jumped off a whole building i was like you think he died because he might have jumped off the fucking building yeah i don't yeah. think he might have had some issues and it's really sad but i don't think marijuana killed him because no one's ever died from marijuana yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know and, you know, just bringing it back to teleportasm, you know, that was kind of like the idea of, you know, taking it from something kind of uh, benign like marijuana to something, you know, more extreme and possibly dangerous because there absolutely is a, an addiction metaphor to teleportasm um, that kind of like it, it is, is born out of this, you know, cannabis, cannabis culture community. Mm hmm. Um, you know, it had, it, I don't know, I guess it kind of rang of that, the, you know, they, they don't want to legalize it because it's a gateway. Right. And it's a gateway to, to getting, to getting high. So and it, there is that metaphor going through, you know, teleportasm that, you know, Hey, this is the gateway. But I also, I also see in it sarcastically and I'm stealing from another comic, but I think that, that marijuana cannabis is a gateway to like pizza uh, it doesn't it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna be a gateway to another drug it's a gateway to fuck them i'm fucking i got man i gonna need to eat something man yeah, i like that <laughs> i'm very, very relaxed good. and i'd like a pizza right now you know <laughs> yeah so everything we're talking about here it reminded me of the case in the uk about what 15 years or so ago now with Professor David Nutt, who was the government's chief drug advisor, 
and he was commissioned to write a paper on how dangerous each drug is. And then they fired him because he claimed that ecstasy and LSD and cannabis and many other illegal drugs were less dangerous than alcohol. They fired him because he came up with the conclusion that they didn't want. I don't doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in, in Japan, I mean, yeah, the, there's a very ignorant and a very kind of all drugs are bad attitude, kind of similar to the put cannabis in the class A as they did in America. I, I still can't believe that. <laughs> that happened and i also can't believe how have i just found out in 2024 how have i lived my life without knowing that it was not in fact a class c but i, I think that i mean J japan yeah it's a lot slower than the west but um well, I mean, uh, and they, in the philippines cannabis users are are being uh given capital punishment yeah i mean it's it's absolutely wild yeah but in in mm -hmm. japan i mean there's certain cbd oils that are now legally allowed to be sold so that gives me hope that it's like okay it's a small step but it's a step in the right direction hopefully they, they can take enough steps where it's legal before i'm dead but i honestly don't know <laughs> if that I will hope, actually man. happen to be honest i won't be putting yeah. any bets on that Speaking of uh, CBD oil, I'm enjoying a little as we speak. Helps keep my uh, my neurons firing. Yeah, yeah. And the, the thing is, as well, I mean, I, I am predisposed to arthritis, and I kind of keep it in check through dietary means. But if they could make, you know more cbd available so there was more variety and they could make it more affordable because unfortunately the stuff that is available is very very expensive and not as effective then it would make a genuine difference on my life and would help with chronic pain but i haven't found a way to uh tax it sufficiently yet so never okay, mind I'll take this cross for you. <laughs> yeah yeah you can get it like my me and my mom both have glaucoma and she has a lot worse than me and from what i understand that that we can you know get it with you know a doctor's order you mm -hmm. know and i found out about that you know she said i can go get marijuana anytime i want to and just can damn doctor and i'm like well why don't you <laughs> you know and she's like well because it's illegal i'm like well you're voting for the wrong people mom let's <laughs> it's not illegal if you can get it and then they told me i could get it too um but i've talked to people who have who have gone through that program and they're like N -n you don't want to do that it's not it's not the same thing <laughs> i'm like what do you mean it's like no you just trust me been there done that not doing it again it's not worth it so i'm like well that sucks well there's this so thing I, guess, I guess it's like it's it's like marijuana from the government here you go <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, th th those were concerns, you know, like I said, you know, having seen the medical marijuana movement from the very beginning, people were worried that, you know, uh, asking a doctor for a medical marijuana prescription meant that you were going to end up on a government list, you know, and, and that's a genuine fear. So it's so much easier to just legalize it, especially in light mm -hmm. of the fact that there's all this compelling evidence that it's wonderful for chronic pain and creativity and uh it's a very versatile versatile product yeah i think what he was getting at was that the amount that you receive and the the quality of the product was not what you would expect hmm interesting so i was like okay and i said well i know they have you know like you were talking about different strains of marijuana but i didn't know he says well he says that's it's it's pretty bunk, <laughs> you know. So I'm like, in California, okay. when you go to your uh, uh, dispensary and you look at the product they have, it tells you what percentage of THC is in your flour or your oil or your edible. So uh -huh. you know what's in there. I mean, they figured it out. You know, uh, they can measure these things. And if you want something strong, you get something that's 
28 to 33 percent THC. If you want something mild, you have something that's a 11 to 23 percent THC. So, you know, I, I don't know how they're running things in Texas, but come on, come on out to California because you don't even need a card or anything. You just have to be over 21. And uh, yeah, no, no need to go all the way to Amsterdam any longer. <laughs> Yeah, a point that I was going to make about 10 minutes ago because we completely segued into different directions and I also forgot. <laughs> My point was that, like, I think as well I have hope for there being general acceptance because there's also, like, a massive movement of people getting into psilocybin and mm -hmm. hallucinogenics and just looking at how that can expand both creativity and almost kind of consciousness and understanding of the world people not just using it creatively but to help unpack trauma so i i think that movement is is showing at least this shift that at the very least people do not any longer think all drugs are created equally which which is as absurd as saying all alcohol is created equally. It's like, well, right. yeah. Or all horror books are created equally. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Joshua Milliken on This Is Horror. Next episode, we will have the second and final part with Josh Milliken. But if you want to get that and every other episode ahead of the crowd, become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early access to each and every episode, but you can submit questions to all the people that we chat with on this is horror. Got a lot of great ones coming up very soon. We'll be talking to Sandy King Carpenter of Storm King Comics. Also the wife of John Carpenter. So a lot of excellent comic collaborations from Storm Kings. We'll also have Jason Pargin returning to the show soon. We will be talking to Nat Cassidy, LP Hernandez. Next year we're looking to have a conversation with Ali Milinenko, whose name I hope I have pronounced right, but... Sometimes I don't, so apologies if I've got that one wrong. It's a lot of great episodes coming up, and a lot of good reasons to be a patron. So head to patreon.com forward slash this is horror, and if it's a good fit for you, I would love to see you there. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick advert break. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching as the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Another way you can support the podcast is to leave a review on Apple Podcast. We got a recent one on the US store from Mandarin AB, which I read out last episode. But we always welcome more. We love your feedback. We like hearing what your favorite episodes are, what you like about This Is Horror, perhaps what you don't like, who you want to hear on the show in the future. So if you do have the time, leave us a review. 
drop us a few stars on Apple Podcast and we'd really appreciate it. Well, that about does it for another episode of This Is Horror. I'll see you next time for part two with Joshua Milliken. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.